We now come upon Book 5, Chapter 1, Part 3, Article 2, and this is the famous section covering the education of youth. And here we're doing Article 2, called Of the Expense of the Institutions for the Education of Youth. When it came to education, Smith had some views similar to those on infrastructure. He thought it should be largely self-financing, and he was in general suspicious of the idea of financing it from the general revenue of a national government. What really comes through most strongly in this section is Smith's overall suspicion of the professor as an individual who, above all else, is inclined to shirk and not teach very well. Smith is also skeptical of educational endowments, which at the time were most clearly represented by the established universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Smith saw endowments as a way of paying professors whether or not those professors did a good job teaching their students. Just to catch a bit of the flavor of Smith on the endowed educational institutions, he refers to them as, quote, the sanctuaries in which exploded systems and obsolete prejudices found shelter and protection after they had been hunted out of every other corner of the world. Smith believed most strongly in a system where the rewards of professors would depend directly on how many students they attract, where literally how much the professor is paid would depend on how many students enrolled to take that class. This was yet another area where Adam Smith believed in the virtues of competition. Smith points out that in ancient Greek and Rome, some systems of education were based upon this principle, and they seem to have done pretty well, in spite of the limited means of those societies. Once again, without such payments, Smith believes that the natural tendency of the professor is to shirk and not perform his duties. Smith has some other remarks about the educational practices of that time. For instance, wealthy British families often would send their sons on what was called the Grand Tour, a large stint of time abroad, maybe, say, a year, when that individual would go visit the leading cities of the European continent. Smith regarded this mainly as a waste of time, and he called it a frivolous dissipation. In an ideal world, Smith thought that education ran best when there were no public institutions involved, and he draws a comparison between fencing, where education is mostly private in Smith's time, and Smith believed this education went very well, and then riding, where education is performed by a large number of public institutions, but in Smith's view, education in riding was not nearly so effective as education in fencing. That said, Smith did not believe in strict laissez-faire when it came to education. Smith thought it was appropriate to set up a small school in every district. This school would be run at public expense. Public aid would go mainly for buildings and not to pay teachers not to teach or to shirk their duties. The school would be governed by a moderate fee, affordable by all. And in all of these recommendations, Smith is drawing upon the Scottish parish system of schooling during his time. Overall, Smith thought, thought that some government involvement was necessary simply because, in his view, the poor lacked the time and the money to support their own education in the proper manner. Also in this section, we find an interesting discussion of how education works among barbarians, and there Smith believes that the pressure simply to survive is so strong that people tend to educate themselves. So he writes about the barbarians, and I quote, Every man has a considerable degree of knowledge, ingenuity, and invention, but scarce any man has a great degree. For the barbarians, this comes automatically without formal education, and in this section I read Smith as saying that the necessity of educating people is actually one offshoot of having enough prosperity that people are not faced with immediate starvation if they don't all make good decisions. For further reading, if you'd like some good background on the Scottish and English educational institutions of this time and how they fit into Smith's argument, including the Scottish parish schools and also the endowed universities, I recommend a piece by Edwin G. West called Private and Public Education, a Classical Economic Dispute, available online.